Hello everyone, this is Graham Anderson from Four Corners of the Board, and today I'm going to be looking at Tau Seti Planetary Crisis. Now, when I read the back of the box and saw it was a 4X game that centered on an economic engine, asymmetrical powers, and strategic manipulation, and that it was only 30 minutes a player, that really piqued my interest. I mean, a 4X game that you can play in about two hours with four players, I knew I had to try this. Now, once everything was set up on the table, it definitely looked like a 4X game with the planets to visit, missions to complete, people to attack, goods to transport. I thought this was going to be good. Well, did it live up to my expectations? Let's get to the table, see how it's played, and then we'll come back for my final thoughts on Tau Seti Planetary Crisis. Now, there are a fair number of rules to the game, so I'll not be going through all of them, but I will try and give you an overview of how the game plays. I'm also going to be using the rules as they are written in the published rulebook. Now, there are updated rules online. Now, the goal of the game is to collect the most victory points. In this game, they're called Galactic Points. These are going to be gained either by resolving crises on planets, building orbital stations, gaining wealth, having certain cards in your hand at the end of the game, and achieving victories in battle either against other players or by marauders on the table. The game is set up so you have a random playing board with each exploration point covered by a knowledge token. The outer limit tiles are placed off to the side and can be added to the board during gameplay. All the cards are set up along the side. You've got specialist cards, crisis cards, knowledge cards, interplanetary mission cards, diplomacy cards, objective cards, exotic tech cards, and cabinet member cards. And I'll talk briefly about these cards when they come up in gameplay. The Galactic Epo is set up with the items the players can purchase during the game and tokens needed during the game. And the exchange is also set up with all the commodity market value set to the lowest value, along with the current round marker. Damage markers and virus markers are placed off to the side as well. Now each player will have a class unique player board. That is, the cost for each of the different actions is different on the player boards. Each player will also have three character cards, of which they will choose one to use during the game. They will also have track markers, which will show how much money or tau they have, how much energy they have, and how much material they have. The starting resources will be based on the character card you've chosen. Each player also has six resource cubes, and during setup, each active player places five of the resource cubes in the bag, and each other race that is not being played puts two cubes in the bag. Each player also has four action markers, used to keep track of how many actions they've done on a turn. They will also have a command ship and orbitals of their color which start on their planet. The claim tokens, battle tokens, and the plus markers are placed beside the player board. The game is played over a number of rounds. In the basic, short version of the game, it is played over eight rounds. It can go longer, or you can choose alternate ending conditions. Each round follows the same process. You have the enlightenment phase, where new crises occur, then it goes to the player's action phase until all players have used their four actions. During the enlightenment phase, you will draw a cube from the bag. This represents which planet the crisis can potentially occur. You're going to place one specialist card and one crisis cards face down on the planet. Then each player in turn has an option to play crises and or specialist cards from their hand to this new deck. For each one that they do, they will receive three energy. Once all players have played their cards, the deck is shuffled and then revealed. Any Crisis card that has a matchling Specialist card, therefore the Icons match, is prevented, and the both cards are discarded. If there are any Crisis cards that are not being prevented, the one with the highest number is the one that is going to activate. Any card that was not used is returned to the bottom of the deck. If a Crisis card is activated, read the text and place the corresponding Crisis on the planet based on the icon on the card. Reveal the Crisis token and adjust the commodity in that market. If the crisis is on an active player's planet and the affected resources match their primary specialization, they will have one of their cubes placed back into the bag. Finally, apply the effects on the bottom of the crisis card to all players. So once the enlightenment phase is done, we then move to the action phase. Now, before the action phase occurs, you have to kind of do some setup work for each round. First, whomever is the first player will decide what cabinet roles each other players will have, and they're usually beneficial to the other players, so it's up to you to decide who will get what. Then, if there are any cubes on your home planet, which will be from building orbitals, you will gain money and or energy based on the number of cubes. Finally, you remove all the commodity tokens from the board and drop their market value by one for each token they remove. Then, you randomly place the new ones out and adjust the market values back up. 
Each player will then receive a commodity of the commodity token on their home planet. Now, each player will take their four actions. And these I'm going to skim over, but they all have the same basics idea of paying for whatever it is under the action you wish to take, and then taking that action. First is moving. You can move your ship up to the propulsion level. Normally you just move from hex to hex, but there can be tiles which can affect your movement. I should quickly mention about your ship's system levels. The number of dots over each system will show you what level they're at, or what the capacity is, or how many weapons you have. These can be upgraded, and I'll talk about the upgrade action later on. Now, if you are on a hex with an explore token, which are these, you can take the explore action. Flip the token over and draw a card matching the symbol. The cards will normally have a skill test on them, and you will roll that many dice that match this, your skill. Now, your skills are listed on your character card. If it's not listed, you will always roll default of two dice. If you roll a 5 or a 6, which is considered a success, you might get a bonus for being able to keep the knowledge token if you successfully pass the test. Now, if you successfully explore an explore token, you can place a claim token on the other end of the route. You may now not explore any other exploration point until you've completed this route. If you explore both sides of the route, you remove your claim token and remove the cube of your color from the bag and place it on the indicated spot. Once you have a cube, or replace it later with an orbital, you can now expand your economic influence by moving off of the main board and start to draw outer limit tiles from where you have this cube or orbital. During the exploration action, you might come across galactic marauders, who will attack you right away. They will roll dice equal to their value and have that many shields. Each 5 or 6 will be a hit against you, and you're going to roll a die to find out which of their systems it hits. And then you will roll the number of dice equal to your weapon level, and each 5 or 6 damages them. The battle will continue until either one of your systems is destroyed, that is the damage on it exceeds the level of the component, or you destroy the marauder. If you win, you'll receive one GP token and the marauder token is discarded. The next action you can take is the repair action. You pay, depending on whether you're on a planet or not, money to repair your damaged ship. Now once you have one of your research cubes on the board, you can take the build action. Place the cube from the board onto your home world and place one of your orbitals where the cube was. You can also take the Recruit action. Draw one card from the Crisis and Specialist deck, then discard back down to 7. If you're on a planet, you can take the Interplanetary Mission action. Draw three cards and decide which one you want to take. There are two different types. Skill checks, roll dice based on the skill required. Remember, if you don't have the skill, you will always roll at least two dice, and take the outcome. The other type of card is a Transport card. Pay the cost on the card, Move your ship to the destination planet and receive payment based on how many sectors there were between the pickup location and the destination location, and you multiply that by your cargo size. If you want to increase any of your ship's components, you're going to be taking the upgrade action. Pay the market value of the resource listed under the component, multiply it by the level you wish to buy. You can also play the market, and therefore you can take the sell buy action. Pay the market value to receive a commodity, and you can have a maximum of four of each commodity. And selling is just the opposite. Give up the number of commodities and receive their market value. If you have the items on hand, you can also take the Resolve Crisis action. You must have a specialist card and a knowledge token that matches a crisis on a planet. You can resolve a crisis from anywhere on the board. If you do not have the specialist card, you can instead trade three identical tokens to resolve the crisis. Once resolved, the crisis token is removed and you receive either 3 GP or a diplomacy card. As always, if you have no energy, you can also take the refuel action to get 5 energy. Now the last action I'm going to cover is the battle action, where players can initiate battle between their command ship and either an orbital or another player's command ship. If you go after an orbital, then the player whose orbital is attacked, the defender, will roll dice for each orbital in the star system. If the defender rolls a success, they successfully defend the attack, and the attacker takes damage and rolls a die to find out which system was damaged. If the defenders do not roll any successes, they lose their orbital and a resource cube from their home world is returned back to the bag. Now if the battle is between a command ships, they first assign their shields based on the level of their shields. The attacker will then roll the number of dice equal to their weapon level. Each number represents a system. If there is no shield on the defender's system, the damage gets through. And again, if there any damage gets through, then the defender will have a last chance to try and stop that damage. They're going to roll a number of dice equal to their computer level, and if any of the numbers that they've rolled match the damage that got through, then that damage is blocked. But any unblocked damage will hit the respective system, and you're going to be placing a marker there. 
Players then reassign their shields and change roles and start again. The combat will last four rounds or until one player destroys one of the other player's systems. If you were the initiator of the battle and you win, you will lose one GP, but you get to steal either a crisis or specialist card, one knowledge token, or all onboard commodities of the defeated ship. If you are not the initiator of the battle and you win, you get one GP, and the initiator still loses one GP. So this is the very high level of all the actions in the game, and I have skipped and glossed over many aspects of these actions. Once the game is complete, after eight rounds, or whichever ending method you choose, you will then go to the final scoring. Now you're going to score points for having excess energy or money. If you have any specialist cards or crisis cards left in your hand that have GP points on them, and they match your character symbol, shown here, either a dot or no dot, you will get that many victory points. If you are able to achieve your objective cards, you'll get those points as well. For each cube or orbital you have on the non-planetary system, you will get GP points based on the system. And finally, you'll add up all the GP tokens you've received during the game. The player with the most points is the winner. I just want to reiterate that this is by no means comprehensive, as I have skipped over several aspects of the actions and rules. So let's get back to the table to see what I thought about Tau Seti Planetary Crisis. Well, as you can see, there are a lot of rules in this game, and I still skipped over many of the rules in the overview. Now let's talk about components and theme first. Now, I did like most of the components. I like the, the ships were nice. Um, I'm not sure whether this is an updated Kickstarter thing, because there are another set of kind of wooden things that you can use instead. Uh, I believe the rules say that, that these are the, the basic ones that come with the game. So, they're, they're fine. The player mats are very flimsy. Um, I do have a problem with the kind of the, the corners on these kind of curling up. So when you're trying to put a piece on here, they do tend to slide around. But you know what, I'm going to blame that on my environment. Uh, it is uh, humid. So, you know what, it's not a huge deal. Now the art to me, honestly, um, kind of the art on here and on the faction book, I found it a bit amateurish. Now I do like the space art, like the planets, but the character uh, models I wasn't a big fan of. Now the cards are easy to read. You know, once, had, once you know how to read them, they're kind of very straightforward. That wasn't an issue. The cardboard chits, decent quality. You know what, there's really not much I can complain about with the components. So let's go on to theme. Now I thought the theme was very well done. Each faction has a backstory. Uh, there actually is a little uh, book here that kind of outlines all the, the different factions. It kind of gives you their backstory, why they're here, kind of what their specialty is. I thought that was very well done. And definitely some of the players who I played with who are more into the theme than I am really appreciated reading up on them. Also on the back of your, your player boards, it kind of gives you the, the same type of thing. Now, speaking of playing, let's get how to uh, the game plays. And oh boy, um, first of all, the rule book. Now this game, I understand, is not an easy game to teach as there are many aspects of the game that are kind of intertwined. But you know, once you start playing, it does seem to flow. What makes it more difficult is when there are rules that you need to know that aren't in the rule book. You know, how are things supposed to work? It's not in here. They'll mention something, but they won't tell you how to do it. For example, you get three faction cards at the beginning of the game. The rules don't say to pick one. Yes, it makes common sense to pick one, but it doesn't say to, that you only get one per game. Can you change them from round to round? Because each of them kind of gives you a different skill set. And what about the objective cards? Since most of them are uh, return the commodities at the end of the game, for example, this, this card here, you know, return uh, three of, of each of these, or uh, yeah, four of each of these, when can you do this? Do you wait until the end of the game? And if you have two of these that both have the same commodity on them, you can only ever have four commodities, which means you can only fulfill one of these. Is it an action to do it? Can you do it whenever you want? The rules don't say. And it's things like that which makes learning the game frustrating. Now, luckily, there is an updated rules on BGG. And you know what? And that's another nitpick of mine. As one of the updated rules is for the Marauders that you can find during their Explorer action. The rule book says the attack and defense values are basically the numbers printed on them. So two or four. So they're either rolling two dice or four dice. That makes them very difficult to kill. So the BGG update says, no, it's only supposed to be one or two dice. And the shields are also lower. How is this not caught in the rule book before it's published? This seems like something that should have come up during playtesting, and I don't understand why that rule made it into the rulebook. Speaking of the explorer action, this was both my favorite and most frustrating action in the game. When you explore an unknown exploration point and reveal the tie type, let's just say it was the, the science action here, or the cosmic action, 
The skill check is always the same. This one says check your diplomacy. Every single one you do, check diplomacy. And if you don't have that skill in your card, you only get to roll two dice. And you have to get a nine plus to pass. Good luck. 25 to 30% chance of making it. And if I fail, I'm going to lose something. Energy or cargo or get damage. Now, you can spend two Tau to re-roll a skill check. But that's all the mitigation you can do. Now, I should mention, though, that there is one more slight way to mitigate it. And that's because I didn't go through all the minor actions during the walkthrough. You do have the ability to assist other players by putting some of your cubes on their planets, or you can trade with them. You can also play specialist cards as a free actions, and some of those will boost up your skills or other beneficial effects, but you can only use that once per round. So yes, technically, if you had a specialist that had diplomacy, you could play the card and use that, that uh, speciality. But again, it's random whether you get that or not. So you know what? Let's step back from the issues I have with the game and look at it more at a higher level as, down, as opposed to down the specifics. The game feels like a bunch of borrowed mechanisms for more popular games. And unfortunately, I think the other games seem to have done the mechanisms better. All through the game, the players I played with seemed to feel very little uh, accomplishment due to the randomness of the game. You weren't going on an epic conquest to do a, a massive 4x, you were just reacting to the randomness of the game. Oh, there's a crisis that pops up on the planet. Do you have the specialist card and the knowledge token? No? Then randomly draw a chorus and explore random tokens until you find it and if it's something, again, because of these cards, can you even do it? Even at the end of the game, why is there a difference between a dot, the dot and the no dot scoring cards? It, it, what? Why? Ugh. There's just kind of so many little things that really kind of held this game back for me. And I hate being so negative on a game, especially when I feel like there's a good idea here. Mainly because I can point to the other games that have these mechanisms, but I think the designer really needs to either streamline or rework the mechanisms to make them flow better and make sure the rules reflect the proper process. And honestly, if as much time was spent as writing the backstory and faction stories was taken to make sure that the game worked well, I think we would have got a much better game. I know it's an awful lot of negatives, but you know what, after playing the games, I believe I was the most positive one, and as you can tell from these final thoughts, I'm having a real hard time with this. Most of the other players say they, they did not want to play this game again, mainly down to the randomness. And I can, I can see something in this game, but just not enough to recommend this game. This is one that should be left on the shelf until there is a second edition and they majorly clean up and streamline the rules, and until then, this is one that should just be left on the shelf. And that's it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.